darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We must concentrate not merely on the negative expulsion of war, but on the positive affirmation of peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was August 9th, 2014, about 12 noon. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had just gotten home from running some morning errands and had just put up the last of my groceries. It had been a long week. I was extremely tired, like really tired. I was even contemplating on just sitting on my couch, taking a quick power nap. But as soon as I sat down, I decided against it because I knew that if I took a nap in the middle of the day, that would mean a long night for me. So I picked up my phone and what does most of us do when we're tired or we're bored and we're trying to stay awake? You guessed it, I logged on to social media to see what the rest of the world was doing. I logged on to Facebook and as I'm scrolling down my timeline, I see several people appearing to be going live. It's, that's what it looked like. My volume was turned down so I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I saw an image and I'm thinking this couldn't be, this couldn't be. So I turn up the volume and as soon as I do, I see this image. I hear yells, screams, and cries. As I'm watching in horror, because I'm like, this cannot be, I hear the person who's recording, he's narrating saying that a young man had been shot and killed by a police officer in Ferguson. That hit very close to home for me. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I have family and friends that reside in the city of Ferguson. I even attend church there, Believer's Temple Word Fellowship Church. I later learned that that young man's name was Michael Brown. He was 18 years old, the same age as my youngest son at the time. I'm like, oh my God, this cannot be. If I was sleepy before, I was wide awake at this point. And for the next few days, the next few weeks, and the next few months, this incident was appearing on all local television, all local news stations, all global news stations, CNN, Fox 2 News, everywhere you look, there was news about Ferguson. And then images like this. So there was protesting, there was rioting, there was looting. And at the time, I worked at a facility that was two hours away from Ferguson. In the hospital that I work, there was big screen televisions mounted throughout the facility. Everywhere you walk, there was a big screen television. And you guessed it again, Ferguson. It was as if I could not escape it, even at work. I went to the cafeteria to get lunch to escape it. There was a television. You guessed it, Ferguson. Images like this. It got so bad, I could not focus. I didn't want to go to work. I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't think. It got so bad that I took it upon myself to make an appointment to see the hospital administrator, to possibly talk to him about changing the channel. I mean, we're a healing institution, right? It should have been something more positive on the television. That didn't go over well. The ironic thing was I told myself day in and day out as I drove home, I'm not gonna turn on the television. I'm not gonna watch the news today. I'm not gonna log onto social media. And every single day, I did just that. Turned on the television, watched the news of Ferguson, was logged on to social media, arguing with people in the comments, getting hyper, uh, getting hypersensitive. I was quick tempered, I was edgy. I became so just distraught. I didn't know how to handle myself or my emotions. I was quick tempered with my husband. I was threatening my sons. I told them that if anybody called me and told me that they were anywhere near the incident, looting and rioting, that I would drive two hours and come to find them and there would be consequences. I would be just like this mother. She was featured on the news 
because she saw her son and she went down to the incident. And as you can see, she removed her son by force. That would be me. I would be that mother. It got so bad I couldn't sleep. I wasn't eating well. I couldn't go on like that. Eventually, I went to go see my healthcare provider and I was diagnosed with a mild case of PTSD, depression, and anxiety. I was prescribed medication to help me to sleep because I could not shut my brain off. As I went through this ordeal, I started seeing images like this. And I was thinking, I'm not there. I'm not directly there. I'm not on the ground. I'm not a part of the protesting. But I see these children that are. And my health was impacted in a negative way. What was happening to these children? What was happening to the people in the community, in my community? According to the World Health Organization, 200,000 homicides are committed each year among youth ages 10 to 29 years of age. That's 43% of all homicides annually. And St. Louis, St. Louis was ranked ninth in the nation for the number of youth murdered by gun violence. In the city alone, almost half, 46% of victims were under the age of 25 years of age. And over half, 51%, of all suspects were believed to be under age 25. Now, I don't know about you, but those statistics are quite startling. I was thinking to myself, what can I do? I'm one person, one woman. What can I do? How can I change that? I know that I can resemble Wonder Woman. Maybe it's the hair, or maybe it's my invisible cape. I don't know. No, but seriously. I knew that I could not change the world by myself. I knew that I couldn't save everyone and change all of the problems. However, what I did know that if I was committed and if I was dedicated to putting one foot in front of the other to help at least one child at a time, that it would make a difference. So that's exactly what I set out to do with the help of my church, my community, teachers, administrators, parents, volunteer mentors, anyone that wanted to lend a helping hand. We developed a faith-based organization based on four core values, faith, love, hope, and resilience, to teach children how to love themselves, to teach children that they are valuable, to teach children how to cope, how to be resilient. That is what we set out to do. Over the past three years, I have had the honor to hear and to see changes in children that have been a part of our program. I have had the honor to hear the stories, the positive stories that didn't start out so positive, come from children as well as their parents. Over the summer, we partnered with several local organizations and we were able to give back to the community in a health fair. This young man, when he first came to us, he shared with us how he had lost two close friends to gun violence. He also shared with us how it impacted him, how he was depressed, he felt isolated, he no longer wanted to do the activities that he once loved, like playing football. All of those things contributed to his grades going down. We were able to assess him for PTSD because he had been traumatized. He got the counseling service he needed, and he was also linked with a mentor who helped him to get back on track. That young man, I'm proud to say, he graduated high school and he is now attending college doing very well. I don't know if you all remember, like I do, all the vivid pictures, the looting of those businesses, the damages, the burnt, some of those businesses were burned down. A lot of business owners lost their businesses as a result of Ferguson. It looked totally deserted. Now it is being rebuilt. And there is a $12.4 million facility that has been built and it's um, due to open on October of this year, a Boys and Girls Teen Excellence Center that will be a safe haven for young adults ages 10 to 18 years old. Now you know I've partnered with them, right? I'm so proud of that. This is what it will look like. So I think it's safe to say that we all can agree 
that this world that we live in is a lot more dangerous than it was one year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. We can all agree that something needs to change. My challenge to you is for you to look deep inside yourself, search your heart, look in your community, for some of us, even in our own families. Identify young adults who are struggling, who face challenges. Some of them may just need a mentor. Maybe they need an inspirational word. Maybe they need financial support. Whatever it is, whatever you're able to give, get off the sidelines and give it. As you can see, I have committed to making my city safe again. My challenge and my question to you is, will you be a part of that change?